<laughs> you gotta, as soon as I do, sometimes you have to listen to the people around you. But you drive the show. Um, so my name's Connor McCann, uh, and I am also known as Tenzin Lungtuk or Yeshi Kelpo. Uh, you know, we all sometimes have many names. Um, so the first thing I actually really want to do is that, as we all know, Geshe Domsho is at Guto Tantric College right now, um, and he wants all of you to know that he's doing well uh, right now. They've been um, actually doing a lot of prayers in uh, preparation for Sagadawa. Uh, the other day um, was the Waisak, and Waisak is um, the Paranavana birth of Buddha. So there were a lot of more um, pujas that he was doing and getting ready for and different uh, rituals that he's learning and, or, or relearning or learning in different detail than he's ever learned before. So um, part of my talk is actually about enthusiasm for the path. So I was hoping that we could actually send him a WhatsApp message. It is very late at night there. Uh, it's actually quarter to midnight. So um, it's he may not get it tonight. He might, who knows what he's doing. But I'm hoping that we can all sort of shout very loudly, maybe uh, 30 seconds or midnight, some encouraging words to him. We can send it off. We're probably not going to hear anything. Um, but I think that would be really helpful to him to hear from all of us, um, at least here in the Gompa. Uh, and you all on Zoom land can just know that it's being done. Um, so let's do that, yeah? OK, let's practice once so that we know we're loud. And then we'll do it even louder the second time, yeah? Okay, so just whatever encouraging words you have, maybe your name, maybe, you know, Omahong, maybe good study, keep it up, whatever. Okay, so on the count of three, let's practice. Okay, so one, two, three. Yeah. All right. So this time is for real, but you're gonna be even louder. Yeah? Wow. Okay. One, two, three. Woo! All right. Yeah, I'm gonna just, let's just tell them what that was now. Oh, Tachi Dele, just a little message to you, Geshela, from all of us here at Lions Roar. Okay. We'll see what he makes of that. <laughs> I tell that. Okay, so if you guys read my little blurb, I, I had something that sounded a little weird at the, the beginning. Um, and that was actually, I'm going to read it out to you. Is that, Amazement is the feeling of great surprise or wonder. Rapt attention at something awesomely mysterious or new to one's experience is amazing. Cultivating amazement along the Buddhist path seems like something that would be wonderful. Wonderful is an adjective, effective or efficient, far beyond anything previously known or anticipated. Um, and I think that the path is amazing. And all of those are definitions. So I'm studying Tibetan. And there's something actually within debate about seni, which is what is the definition of a word? And how do we get to different definitions and are they the same? And when we substitute amazing and wonderful, rapt attention at something awesomely wondrous or new at one's experience is amazing. Rapt attention at something awesomely wonder, mysterious or new at one's experience is the definition of wonderful or wonder. Rapt attention. Doesn't that sound a little bit like shamatha? Like, what are we concentrating on? What's a rapt attention? So I think that's just amazing that that actually comes out in English definitions. So something that I was thinking about the other day is how many sentient beings are there on this planet? Like, individual sentient beings. Have you thought about that? Like, how many are there? We know that there's about 8 billion humans. Can we actually cognize 8 billion as a number? 
we know that there's about 14 of us up around the Earth in orbit. So they're not actually on the planet right now. <laughs> we can count 14. <laughs> we, we, most of us have enough fingers and toes to count to 14. But 8 billion. Um, after that, we sort of have to make some estimates. We can estimate populations of individual species, like 8 billion humans. But the rest of that, actually, when I tried to look it up, is based on species. How many species are there? Um, and to do that, you sort of need to know what a species is or how we actually determine species or count species, um, which took me back to sort of middle school and high school and elementary school science class um, and our taxonomy, taxonomy uh, which apparently has changed since I was in school. There's a new layer. Uh, there's actually domain. So domain is where we're actually splitting between uh, organisms whose cells have nuclei, nucleuses, and cells that don't, which is interesting. Um, so it's not just kingdom, family, class, order, family, genus, species, or as I got in trouble for when I was in eighth grade of King Philip had great sex. I came over for great sex because I could not spell the word sandwiches because I was not good at spelling. Uh, it's actually domain. So now you have to put in domain. So the human taxonomy is eukaryota, animalia, chordata, mammalia, primates, humata, humanata, sorry, homo sapiens. So that's us. There's eight billions, billion of us. So in 2021, there's a researcher who collaborated results from various species. Um, and there's a, several different lists. Um, some of them are more reputable than others, but this one called the IULN Red List um, said that there were 2.1 million species of animals. And we're just going with animals, right? So we're in the kingdom section. So we've already cut out all those creatures that don't have nuclei. So these are only creatures with nucleuses in their cells and are only animals. Um, and there's some potential overlap and errors, but that includes one point, just over a million species of insects, just species, just different types of insects that we can get so far down that we're not talking about human ancestors. We're not talking about different types of humans. We're talking about species of insects, like different types of ants. Right? different types of bees, very narrow, very finely refined, like, you know, these different kinds of butterflies. You should have a chart of 200 different kinds of butterflies. 11,000 different types of birds, species of birds, 11,000 species of reptiles, and 6,000 species of mammals. There's some estimates that go as high as 100 million species. Some estimates are closer to 8 million, and many of those are yet to be categorized. But these are just the species. These are not the individual creatures. How many bees are in a swarm? How many ants could there actually be just along Bee Street? I mean, how many sentient creatures are out there? That's amazing. It's amazing just to try to think about it. How many ants wander into our cabinets in the summertime looking for water? I mean, you know, we, we sweep up these huge masses of ants to try to take them outside, or unfortunately, they don't make it outside. And you just, you have this big ball of creatures, and you, it's amazing to think of one teeny tiny little ant, and then you get a big ball. How many is that? And it's really amazing to think about these numbers and how many sentient beings there are. In Buddhist taxonomy, if we can call it that, things are a bit different. So we have three lower realms. We have animals, like our cats and dogs and ants. We have predators or hungry ghosts. Um, these are creatures that we don't see, but they're always hungry. And then we have hell beings. And then we have three higher realms. We have humans, demigods, or divas in the god realms. And perhaps you want to think about each of these realms as being populated by billions of individuals, billions of individual creatures. You know, we know about 8 
billion humans here in this realm, but in Buddhist taxonomy, there are actually billions and billions of realms of humans, not just here on Earth, but billions of different planets of Earth. So that's a lot. That's a lot of creatures to think about, a lot of creatures to generate compassion for. But maybe you just want to think about these realms as different uh, characteristics that these individuals have. So billions or millions of humans that are always hungry or angry or full of themselves. And that's a different thought. But it's also an amazing number to think about. So it doesn't really matter how you actually want to characterize that or think about that today. But it's the amazement and the wonder that we have to be able to do that, to be able to think about these things. And these would be the freedoms of the human, right? We have the ability to listen, to cognize, to take in this information and to actually think about it. That's an amazing thing that we can do as humans. We have the ability to meet the Dharma. We can come here to the temple and we can listen to Lama teach. We can listen to each other. We can go online. We can listen to the Dalai Lama. We have, we have this freedom. We have the ability to practice. We can sit and meditate. We have a mind that allows us to do this. And this is actually even more amazing. I mean, we, we want to think that our dog or our cat who's sitting next to us on our, our cushion is doing the same thing we are, but um, in Buddhist taxonomy, that they're really not. They, they're animals. They, they have a different type of mind. And they have Buddha nature. And hopefully they'll be able to meet the same dharma that we can. And that's an aspiration that we can have. And it's amazing to think that they can even wander onto our cushion and have that. But the human mind is considered to be the best mind to be able to meet these things. Um, and this sort of leads us to, you know, the different possibilities of life and those millions of different species that are out there. Could you imagine an ant intentionally trying to wander onto your cushion to listen to you meditate? We think of our dogs and cats coming, but you know how many ants have wandered or how many cockroaches have wandered onto your cushion? Did you think that that was intentional? Did you think that that has the same impact on that ant or that cockroach as it does as your dog or your cat? Um, so I've heard various... Uh, iterations of the, the Sutra of the Turtle and the Golden Ring. And I, I think it's actually a really beautiful one. Um, and I'm actually going to read part of one of the ones that I like the best, because I, th I think it's actually really important that um, the human freedoms and endowments that we have are sort of thought about in a different way, or that we repeatedly consider them. So this is actually a portion from an article from the Buddhist News from 2019. Um, and I'm just going to read it out. So it starts with a little preamble. Um, and it goes, right now we have attained a human rebirth and have the opportunity to attain enlightenment through Dharma practice. So if we waste this precious opportunity in meaningless activities, there's no greater loss and no greater foolishness. This is because in the future, as such a precious opportunity will be extremely hard to find. In one sutra, Buddha illustrates this by giving the following analogy. He asks his disciples, suppose there is, exists a vast and deep ocean the size of those, this world, and on its surface there floats a golden yoke. At the bottom of the ocean lives a blind turtle who surface only once every 100,000 years. How often would that turtle raise its head through the middle of the yoke? His disciple Ananda answers that indeed it would be extremely rare. So there's a couple of things about this that really strike me. It's not just the size of the ocean the Buddha is describing. It's the time frame. And it's the single small golden yoke that the blind turtle happens to find. Turtle may not be looking for it. Turtle just happens to hop up through it in the middle of a world that is an ocean. So there's so many factors of how this amazing coincidence happens. Um, 
and because we're here in this temple, we also have these favorable states. And in Lam Rim, you find what's called the unfavorable states. So the unfavorable states would be living in a place without Dharma, living in a time or place without Buddha, and not having the capacity to engage in the Dharma, or being a god, a long-lived god is specifically what it says. So this means that we're actually able to reflect on our situation. You know, we have the capacity to think and can reflect on where we are, and that's actually pretty amazing. When you think about the ability to have reflection and to learn from what we're doing and to even just what it means to reflect on the fact that we're here, that's actually a very powerful mechanism that we have. If we just went from day to day or we had like, you know, take the movie Memento person who can't reflect on what's happening because they can't remember. That would be a very different life that we would have. The scarcity of what it means, the scarcity of finding that ring, a single ring in a, a world that's an ocean, a single ring, the scarcity of just time. You only come up once every 100,000 years. The scarcity of finding teachers, the scarcity of finding Buddha, finding Dharma. You know, we, we think that it's so easy just to open the internet and find things. The scarcity of finding Sangha, finding friends. Perhaps finding it here is different than maybe a, a child who's born right now in, in a little village outside Lhasa. What does that scarcity look like? What does that mean for that child whose parents taking the risk of showing that child a picture of the Dalai Lama, where that is an illegal act? We're here, we have Dalai Lama right above us, and we don't think anything different of it. We don't think that that's a, a challenging act. We don't think that that's a bold act. There's no scarcity of Dalai Lama's picture here. That's amazing. So we can wonder, we can use our rapt attention in new ways to think about things. We can think about how does this world dazzle me? What, what actually is out there that I can do? What can I do with my rapt attention? What can I do with my amazement and my wonder? I can find the golden ring. I can think about what... I'm doing, I can think about texts. I can, I can think about the 8 billion people, 8 billion humans and where their golden rings are. And I can know that each of us will get sick. We'll get old, we'll die, we'll be born. And I can think about all the eight golden, 8 billion golden rings that might be unfound might be lost in different worlds. And I can hope that maybe we can, I don't know, put some flashing lights on them. I can hope that maybe they can get bigger. I can hope that maybe I will find mine again. So our amazement at our situations and the situations of others, I think, helps to generate our compassion and our wisdom. It brings about bodhicitta. Um, if we're not greatly surprised and not curious about what's going on, why would we investigate or generate any motivation to change? So the very fact that we're here, I think, shows that we're amazed at these things, shows that all of us have some wonder about what's happening. The clashes, our attachment, our aversion, our ignorance, our pride or joy, or, or pride and jealousy, um, these are all things that we can be amazed at. We don't have to be fearful of. We can turn our rapt attention to them and to these experiences. And we can look at them, at the mystery of them, and at each new experience, and we can actually learn from them. But they don't have to be fearful. They can be amazing. Jay Rinpoche says that we do need to exert ourselves in the method for realizing interdependence. And what Nagarjuna says is that we need to look at this correctly and repeatedly. 
without being amazed, without feeling great surprise or wonder, without rapt attention, at something that is awesomely mysterious, which is life or this path. Maybe we're just trudging along the path, hoping for something to change without our actually experiencing it. I prefer the amazing path. I prefer to be curious about just how many individual creatures there are on earth. And I prefer this curiosity and this amazement and this wonder to bewilderment. So a lot of what I said is sort of my walk through uh, and my enthusiasm for the path. Um, so I would like to get your feedback, but first I want to actually read through the three principal aspects of the path by Jason Coppa. Um, so we're going to display that. And then if you want to just read through it with me, or if you just want to listen, that's fine. Um, but maybe we could have a little discussion afterwards. All right. So three principal aspects of the path. I'm going to let the online thing get going. Oh, do you maybe want to change that back? It was a little easier to read. All right. Okay. So homage to the precious noble masters. The very essence of all the Buddha's teachings, the path that is praised by the noble bodhisattvas, and the entrance to all fortunate ones desiring liberation, to the best of my ability, I shall now set forth. You who are unattached to samsara's pleasure and strive to make full use of the freedoms and advantages, you who follow the path delighting all the Buddhas, fortunate ones, listen well with a clear and open mind. With lacking pure renunciation, there is no way to pacify the continual thirst for pleasure in an ocean of samsara. And since all living beings are bound by their craving for existence, you must begin by finding the determination to be free. The freedoms and advantages are rare, and there is no time to waste. Reflect on this again and yet again, and dispel attachment to this life. To dispel attachment to your future lives, contemplate repeatedly and unfailingly effects of karma and the sufferings of samsara. When, through growing accustomed to thinking in this way, hope for the pleasure of samsara no longer arises for even an instant, and throughout both day and night you long for liberation, then at that time true renunciation has been born. Yet, if this renunciation is not embraced by the pure motivation of bodhicitta, it will not become a cause for the perfect bliss of unsurpassable, unsurpassed awakening. So this why so the wise should generate supreme bodhicitta. Beings are swept along by the powerful current of the four rivers, tightly bound by the chains of their karma, so difficult to undo. Ensnared within the iron trap of their self-grasping, and enshrouded in the thick darkness of ignorance, again and yet again they are reborn in limitless samsara, and constantly tormented by the three forms of suffering. This is the current condition of all mothers from previous lives. Contemplate their plight and generate supreme bodhicitta. If you lack the wisdom that realizes the nature of things, although you might grow accustomed to renunciation and bodhicitta, you will be incapable of cutting through conditioned existence at its root. Exert yourself, therefore, in the methods for realizing interdependence. The one who sees the cause and effect operable infallibly for all the phenomenon of samsara and nirvana, and for whom any object of conceptual focus have subsided, has set out upon the path delighted, delighting all the Buddhas, the knowledge and appearance arise unfailingly in dependence, and the knowledge that they are empty and beyond all assertions. As long as the two appear to you as separate, there can be no realization of the Buddha's wisdom. Yet when they arise as once, not each in turn, but both together, then through merely seeing unfailing dependent origination, certainty is born, and all modes of uh, misapprehension fall apart. 
That is when discernment of the view has reached perfection, when you know that appearances dispel the extreme of existence, while the extreme of nothingness is eliminated by emptiness. You also come to know how emptiness arises as cause and effect. Then you will be immune to any view entailing clinging to extremes. When, in this way, you have correctly understood the key points of the three principal aspects of the path, withdraw to solitude, dear son, strengthening your diligence and swiftly accomplishing the ultimate and lasting aim. So that's actually one of my favorite pieces by Jason Kalpa. Um, so I don't know if people have thoughts or comments that they'd like to give or their enthusiasm for the path. Um, so maybe some other people have some enthusiastic points that they would have. So I was just thinking when you were um, contemplating and thinking about all of the numbers of sentient beings that no wonder Avalokiteshvara's head split open, right? You know, it's just... <laughs> Um, I think that I remember one of Lama's sayings that um, the true miracle, the true wonder is when you can look at your mind and change it, right? And um, There was something I read, I don't remember what book it was in, but it was one of Chogam Trungpa's books. And he was talking about meditation and looking at your mind, because I think that's where the real wonder is. That's where the real amazement is for me, is that he said, um, and the inflections are mine, but I can, the inflections are there in what he wrote. He says to look at your mind and then look at that. Just look at that. You know, just look at what is going on. Whoa, look at that. And then you can, you know, then then the miraculous thing, the really wondrous thing is to look at it and 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 then look at it again and look at it again. So yeah, that's that's what's amazing to me. Thank you. Go, go over what are the three principles of the path? Yeah, so the three principal aspects of the path are renunciation, bodhicitta, and uh, dependent origination. You don't need to get that today. I, I think I most don't understand is bodhicitta. Could you maybe talk about that? Yeah, so bodhicitta, in the text, um, Jason Kalpa actually talks about two different types of bodhicitta. Um, and so sometimes you'll hear them spoken about in different ways, which is aspirational and engaged. And bodhicitta is really um, great compassion. And you can have great compassion um, to want to help others and you can engage that by doing things and they're sort of different but that's sort of a really basic level but it's it's not just wanting to help people it's wanting to help people get out of suffering and get out of samsara and there's a there's rich literature on this and you know, we had take bodhisattva vows and I think that when we when we talk about bodhicitta as a, a path or part of this path, especially when we're talking about um, the three principal aspects of the path, it's really sort of just getting the idea of renunciation is saying, 
I want out of suffering. And Bodhicitta is saying, I don't want others to suffer either. And not just aspirationally, I don't want others to suffer, but I'm going to do something so that others don't suffer. And that's part of the path. And, you know, the three principal aspects of the path is sort of taking Lam Rim literature, which, you know, I mean, this is sort of the, the medium length Lam Rim. And then there's sort of the regular Lam Rim, which is this big. And then there's, you know, the great length from Lam Rim, which is, you know, the, the stages of the path. They get really big and really detailed. And this is, you know, 14 paragraphs. So it's sort of as condensed as we can really try to make it. Um, not as condensed. I think there's actually some ways to make it even shorter, but it's trying to just say really basically, let's help other people stop suffering. And to go into what suffering is, we, we can get really detailed also, but it's trying to have that compassion and that, that aspiration that others shouldn't suffer either. And I want to do something about that. And then when we say that, well, how do we do that? Well, we need to know what starts that suffering and how things are connected, which is how we get into the last stage, which is what is emptiness? What is dependent origination or dependent arising? So thank you. Yeah. I really enjoyed your talk, Connor. These types of reflections, I think, um, help me to take it all for granted. Uh, it seems to me that even though the turtle comes up maybe, you know, only once every <clears throat> multiple quadrillions of years or whatever, it is blind. Maybe it doesn't recognize the beautiful ring <laughs> that it finds itself in. You know, it maybe in the beginning, it's sort of like, wow, this is different, um, but maybe it doesn't recognize it. And so in that sense, you know, I, I see that in myself, oftentimes there's a sort of like, yeah, like, that's just how it is. And it kind of like it, the astonishment kind of goes away, right? Like it kind of dulls out a little bit. My, I'm just kind of take it for granted a little bit. And these types of reflections um, on the, <laughs> just the utterly, like, it's amazing, right? Like if we actually stop and really consider the matter, it, it you know, like it, it, it is inspiring, right? And on, on the one hand, you know, to continue with our practice, to um, to try to make something of this special special situation, right? Where we, you know, like we recognize how unique, how different it is compared to what we've experienced in the past. And then the sort of the, it, I think that slowly it sort of develops this motivation to do something with it, right? First there though, is like just the beginning of being appreciative of it. And um, yeah. And, that's all I have to say. I'm super grateful for this kind of meditation. Yeah. You know, the other fun part about that translation and that writing is that it actually says yoke, not ring. So that turtle's captured. And a yoke implies some work needs to be done, at least to me, right? I mean, you put a yoke on an oxen, you put a yoke on a working horse, right? A ring is a lifesaver to us. A ring in an ocean would be a lifesaver. A yoke is you're caught and you got to do some work. A yoke is heavy. A, a ring is buoyant. So, I, you know, I, I, I like that translation for a lot of reasons, but it, I appreciate your sentiment. I mean, it is actually all of these teachings and all these sutras that are out there, it's just like, can I just read them? Can I just download them? Can I get like Amazon Kindle for my brain and have them there readily accessible? No, but I can go over the few that I know and add some. So thank you. Anyone else in New Zealand? Another interesting tidbit with words. I've heard heard and read um, yoga translated as yoke a lot. The idea being that uh, it's the it's the yoking of duality into unity. Yoga, yoke. Um, no. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
so I really liked your talk and what the amazement part brought up for me was um, closer to my mouth was uh, remembering. So I, I use a similar um, being thing when I'm getting like practice practice, you know, just going to take the garbage out. <laughs> But that, um, like I'm at, I'm, this body is actually composed of many beings. Like there's gut bacteria and skin bacteria. And they say like, if we remove all the bacteria, we die. It's actually a beneficial relationship. So like none of us are even this one individual being, uh, how it seems to be. Um, and that sometimes helps motivate me to have that amazement and that remembrance. And so I was wondering if you have any other, other tricks to stay in amazement and to stay um, in that state of remembering throughout the day. Um, I think that One of the things is that when I get a little grumpy, which I, I think more what I'm dealing with now is that I get grumpy about what I don't know or what I can't do, is that it's hard to remember that what I have is not just mine. And so going through that of, well, where did this come from? 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 Where did all these things come from? They're all other people, right? This was given to me. This was made by someone else. This has, you know, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of mantras on it that all came from other people. They came to me from other people. So actually having that, that idea, that sense of dependent origination in each thing, um, that's helpful for me. And that, that's actually really important is to know that the food I eat, the, everything that I have is actually part of a cycle. You know, it's sort of like you have your dependent origination within you. You know, you are dependent on those other beings. And so for me, it's more of a visual thing. Like I, I look at things and I go, oh, tea, where did the tea come from? So sometimes when I get grumpy about I can't do anything, I look and see what, what's been produced around me. And then I'm amazed by that. Like, oh, people with nothing can give me tea from the other side of the world. I can do something. I don't know what I can do yet, <laughs> but I can do something. <laughs> There's something that I can do. And, and if it's only that I can appreciate the tea today, or, you know, I can write a, write a speech. So it's, just, it's an amazing world. It's an amazing world that we're in. So, you know, we just got to, Oh, yeah. Hey, Matteo, do you want to unmute and question? Yeah, uh, hopefully there's no feedback here. Um, hi, my name is Matteo. Uh, I'm, I consider, I've considered myself Buddhist for a while. Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah, yeah, loud and clear. Okay. I've considered myself Buddhist since I was a teenager. I'm in my 40s now, but I'm also, uh, and I've always been, um, a man of science. I love science. I love biology, and uh, I love uh, like evolution and 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 learning about how humans evolved. Like how you were talking about, you know, the different stages of life and different types of life and and single-celled organisms versus cells with 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 nuclei and things like that. I, I love hearing about that. To me, I, I like listening to that stuff, especially on Sunday, because it reminds me learning about um, how life actually became, uh, I find that spiritual because that's, that's who we are. I mean, we, we have the same type of heart as like 
a fish has, you know, like, like the design really isn't that different. But um, part in knowing that and knowing how life evolved, part of that is knowing just how rare it is that uh, we individually were born. And when, one thing when you were explaining um, or when you were, when you were telling that parable about, um, about the turtle, it reminded me of something that uh, I probably read every Sunday. Um, and uh, I just want to read it. It's more, um, it more has to do with uh, biology. Uh, I, I won't say who, who did the quote. I mean, unless you want, but I just want to read it. And I, I, I love this quote. So I just wanted to share it. Um, it says, uh, we are going to die. And that makes us the lucky ones. Most people are never going to die because they are never going to be born. The potential people who could have been here in my place, but who will in fact never see the light of day outnumber the sands of grain in Arabia. Certainly those unborn ghosts include greater poets than Keats, scientists greater than Newton. We know this because a set of possible people allowed by our DNA so mass massively exceeds the set of actual people. In the teeth of these stupefying odds, it is you and I in our ordinariness, ordinariness, sorry if I mispronounced that, that are here. We are the privileged few who won the lottery of birth against all odds. Who, how dare we whine at our inevitable return to the prior state of which the vast majority have never stirred. And uh, that's the end of it. And the, the person who said that was R Richard Dawkins. I, I love listening to Richard Dawkins talks in his lectures. And, but, uh, you know, personally, again, I, I find that just spiritual because it reminds me of how precious life is and um, how rare it is. And every breath is precious. Every breath is a moment for us to appreciate life. And as you were saying, we've, we've been given this gift of awareness. We're aware of our death. We're aware of our life. We're aware of how we came. We have the ability to study things like, like, like Buddhism. And, and to me, I think, um, and we also obviously, you know, we, we have the ability to invest in our lives, uh, whether it's improving certain parts of our lives, our relationships, and just being um, working towards, I, I'd, I'd say a lot, um, enduring adversity and overcoming adversity. I think uh, is, it, we're just so lucky that we are aware of this and, and we're control, we can control our, our, our lizard brain and those reflexes that, that we have, that, that we've evolved like um, emotions, like, like jealousy or anger or hate, and we can, we can analyze it. Only human beings can really do that, can think back. And I mean, as of right now, um, but uh, to me, I, I, the Sundays for me are that time where I kind of stop and I just think about that kind of stuff. And, and you know, I'm working on meditation, but um, that is also a discipline that, that I need to work in. <laughs> Anyways, I just wanted to share that, uh, but I, I love the talk, by the way. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I, and I think that's actually really important is that, um, you know, as we meditate, that that's actually the point of meditation is to be able to have that time sometimes. I mean, that's one type of meditation is to take that time and to look at our, our emotions and to see where they go and to use that time for analysis. So thanks, Mateo. I'm, I'm glad that that's meaningful to you. And thank you for sharing that quote. That's actually really amazing. Um, so we're coming up on noon and I did sort of promise some people that I keep it short and sweet. <laughs> Um, are there any questions or comments? Maybe one more? Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much. Uh, it's been... Oh, more.